There ah, you- the infamous voice. Welcome, everyone, to the Education Technology Industry Network Insider Webinar Series, Tips, Trends, and Advice from Experts in the Field. I'm Bridget Foster, ETIN Managing Director, and your host today. Today's topic is Measuring EdTech Impact in the ESSA Era. And our speakers, our panelists, are Dennis Newman from Empirical Education, Andrew Colson, Mind Research, and Christine Frost, Fox, sorry, Christine, from CEDA, State Ed Tech Directors Association. So the background for this webinar and the research guidelines we'll be talking about goes back actually prior to 2011 over the years. SIIA and Education Division has provided some guidelines and some guidance on conducting research and best practices for doing that in the tech industry. In 2011, we issued the Conducting and Reporting Product Evaluation Research and provided a standard of best practices for conducting and reporting evaluation studies of education technologies. That was six years ago, and we felt, especially with the authorization of ESSA and the dynamic view of evidence for continuous improvement that it prescribes, we've we've made a decision to recommission those and create new guidelines. So this year, earlier this year, we commissioned empirical education to provide new guidelines for research. Dennis Newman, Andrew Jaki, and Valerie Lazaros were joined by an esteemed group that offered comments and editorial advice on the draft. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Dennis Newman from Empirical Education, who can give us the, um, the what and the why for the guidelines for education research. Dennis. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bridget. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act and how that's changed the way we measure uh, impact of EdTech products. Uh, empirical education uh, has been doing uh, uh, research. We've uh, uh, conducted dozens of, of studies uh, to the uh, standards of the U.S. Uh, Department of Education. And as Bridget mentioned, we uh, were authors of the, uh, the current guidelines. It was only six years ago, but it seems like a decade ago that the other uh, guidelines uh, were uh, published because there's been so many changes, as uh, Bridget mentioned, that really motivated uh, the the, uh, the need for this new uh, version. And uh, one is the uh, acceleration of uh, development, which uh, requires a, a much faster turnaround on the research. Uh, and uh, the fact that the, the cloud is now uh, where data are being stored and uh, usage data is particularly useful uh, in conducting research and the guidelines are, uh, uh, have uh, addressed that issue. Um, and of course, the Every uh, Student Succeeds Act, uh, something that I want to talk a little bit about how that uh, make, has made a difference. Uh, you may recall uh, the NCLB, uh, it had a uh, concept of the scientifically based research which was kind of like uh, your product either had it or it didn't. And what's changed is that uh, with ESSA, uh, there's a, uh, a kind of a, what we call a developmental level so that get, has a place where you can get started with the research without uh, having to jump right into a complex of, uh, studies. Um, and you may be familiar with the, uh, that NCLB spawned the uh, the What Works Clearinghouse, sometimes called the Nothing Works Clearinghouse, because uh, it had such uh, uh, a heavy uh, duty as requirements for the uh, quality of the research. Uh, and I just wanted to make clear that uh, this has not gone away with ESSA. In fact, ESSA refers to the What Works Clearinghouse uh, in defining its top levels, uh, but it um, uh, it, it, we, it, uh, ESSA has uh, supplemented with uh, things that uh, will make it easier to get started. And so I'm just going to um, uh, make a comment about the, the guidelines themselves. And, uh, you know, we've had complaints that, uh, that 16 guidelines is a little bit uh, too much. 
uh, and not to mention the 50 pages of dense text that uh, accompanies it. But I'm going to uh, just uh, try to uh, uh, focus in on uh, this uh, guideline number six, just to consider the four levels of Welcome evidence. To Ready Talk. Please enter your seven. Hmm? Uh, there's a little bit background noise. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, anyways, I'm going to be do, uh, uh, just talking about the, these uh, levels. As I mentioned, I think uh, the, we think of them as uh, developmental levels uh, because the, the level four gives you a place to start it, just to demonstrate a rationale for your product. And it involves a literature review and creating a logic model and explaining why it's worth trying. And it uh, gets you into the, into the schools uh, because it's a strong rationale to work in schools to see if the product really has promise as it appears to have on paper. And so that leads to the next level, which, is the, which gives you evidence of promise, not uh, uh, proof, but uh, evidence of promise from a correlation study. And the correlation is, is some aspect uh, usage that is important uh, to the product and the outcomes, uh, and if those two are related, uh, you have a level two uh, research that shows promise. And uh, it, often that's enough to get you into schools, uh, but it also uh, justifies going to the next level, which uh, would get you moderate uh, evidence uh, from a comparison study. And a comparison study would be uh, comparing students who use your product to uh, students who uh, haven't used the product, and there's a lot of matching and statistics involved in that, but um, this is something that can be inexpensively conducted in a single district, and it gives you moderate evidence, which often is uh, all that uh, an ed tech product really needs, uh, but it also, uh, if you get that moderate evidence, it uh, tells you it's maybe worth uh, investing in getting to the next level, where you get strong evidence uh, from a randomized experiment. Now, these are more complex and they require uh, planning and uh, careful design. Uh, but what you get is strong evidence that it at least works in the settings that are just like the ones where the study was conducted. Um, and uh, that is the top level uh, also of the Weber's Clearinghouse. But I want to talk about uh, level three uh, because it's new uh, with ESSA and it is really a starting place that's uh, quite important. Now, what we're talking about here is a correlation, and um, uh, so uh, if, if this is uh, along the bottom, uh, you have a measure of usage, uh, and uh, on the vertical, you have uh, an impact. And you think of all of the dots as, as students, you can see that there's a, a correlation. Now, the correlation doesn't prove that the more usage causes a greater effect, but it certainly gives you a sense that it's a promising result. And that is something that uh, is uh, often uh, sufficiently convincing to a school system to give it a try. Um, and, uh, but it also does another thing, which is it gives you information about how your product is working. Uh, so, for example, uh, on the right, you see that uh, the average session length is really strongly predictive of, uh, of the effect. But if you go over to the left, you see that, uh, in fact, there are certain metrics that are negatively uh, associated with the effect. And that gives you a sense of how your product is working. It also gives you an indication of how to uh, instruct your uh, customers in the best way to implement the program. Now, um, well, different levels. Now, now the... Um, the, uh, you know, ESSA is not the uh, end point. Uh, we continue to work on uh, the, uh, the uh, guidelines and so on. Uh, but the point uh, important to make that uh, ESSA, the research will match ESSA requirements uh, without telling you who it uh, works best for or what level of use is optimal. And these are things that are addressed in the uh, in the guidelines, uh, but not necessarily in uh, uh, all of the research that is coming out. 
and uh, there is a, a very uh, there's still not a solution to the problem of a clear translation between a research study and uh, and how, what the you can expect the impact in a district that's different from the one that where the study was undertaken. Um, so this is just to say that uh, we're continuing to work on the uh, guidelines. We we uh, encourage you to uh, download them, uh, give us uh, comments, uh, critiques, uh, questions, suggestions, and um, uh, here at the bottom is uh, where you can download them. There's other links on the uh, EPN, EPIN site. So uh, thank you, and um, on to the next presenter. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, well, uh, this is a Andrew Colson uh, from Mind Research Institute. Thank you, Dennis. And, and I just want to kind of thank Dennis and his, his team there for uh, all the effort and know-how and savvy that they, uh, they put into this uh, guidelines. I think it's uh, going to be immensely valuable. And, uh, and I'm here just to tell you uh, a little story about an ETIN member and program publisher and kind of how this relates to us and what we're doing with it. Um, and I guess now, we didn't know it at the time, but we were in level four back in 1998, uh, a bunch of neuroscientists and some research ideas. Uh, and uh, that was, I do remember, I signed on not long after that, and we were mostly talking about literally the neuroscience. Uh, but eventually we grew to the uh, extent where we could uh, be doing studies on many sites uh, on our own. Uh, and. Uh, we've been doing that at the unit of grade level uh, because our implementation model is not classroom by classroom adoption, but rather uh, a whole grade at a time at a school. Um, <clears throat> it's a K-8 math supplemental program, uh, and we're in, I think it's 45 states right now, and that's what we're doing studies on. Uh, I want to say a little bit about the experience that I have and we have here uh, with multi-district studies. Uh, uh, we didn't know to call it level one at the time, I guess, but uh, uh, I did go through a, a four-year IES uh, randomized control trial goal three study, and so I have that experience uh, kind of in my mind, uh, <clears throat> along with informing uh, what we do now, uh, which is our own internal uh, quasi-experimental or level two, you know, matched comparison kind of studies that we've been doing since 2010. Uh, and uh, we're able to, to do a lot of those because, again, uh, we're, we're using the grade as the unit of analysis, and so fortunately all the states uh, publish how grades are doing, and we can look at grades using our program and similar grades not using our program. Uh, and this technique was validated by WestEd uh, uh, independently. They took it, and we learned from them back in 13 and 14. So uh, I'm promoting... Uh, doing many quasi-experimental studies, even though it's not at that top level of evidence, um, but uh, the repeatability and the different variety of settings and the different states and state assessments, and you can see a little list off to the, off to the right of uh, <clears throat> some of the quantities that we've been doing quasi-experimentally in that time. Um, so how do the guidelines come in? Well, I actually was uh, involved to, just as a reviewer, but back uh, back in 2011, and I became familiar with the 2011 version of the guidelines. Uh, and on the right, what I have is, uh, it took me a while, like four, four years later, after learning from WestEd also, I finally took some of the wisdom in the 2011 guidelines, and I said, I, I want to align our internal studies to that, even though, interestingly, uh, we never get called out on our little marketing graphics where somebody calls and says, could I see a nice formal, you know, uh, multi-page, uh, rigorous kind of uh, report, but I want to be prepared for that uh, when that day comes anyhow. And so I've been working on that the last five or six years and really uh, adopted several new things because of the 2011 guidelines, uh, in particular, uh, a, a closer and better matching of controls on, on various factors to treatment, the yellow highlighted there. Um, we, we started adopting and now always report out based on effect size, and we have a little section about possible confounders. All of that came from the 2011 guidelines, and now moving ahead to the 2017 guidelines, um, 
<clears throat> there's a lot more good stuff uh, to mine out of it. So um, it's my intention to, uh, even though the, the guidelines don't specifically have a formal way to, to uh, align with or, or meet requirements, but uh, I went through and identified uh, uh, if, if you were to have a list of requirements uh, uh, for aligning with this guidelines, what would they look like? And I turned that into a punch list for us to do internally at MIND. Um, I, I think it's going to, I know it's going to improve uh, from even what we had before, the, the rigor, the completeness, and the transparency of what we're doing. Uh, and I just want to put in a plug for the guidelines. I find the, found them and find them to be very well organized. Uh, it's very easy to read, even though there are the 16 uh, uh, little sections, but they're all not too long, and they're well written, uh, in my opinion. And crucially, uh, I see them as uh, promoting a shared set of labels and descriptions and frameworks uh, and even quality and integrity benchmarks that can really help us as a publisher and the people uh, who are uh, sourcing and, and searching for uh, programs and evaluations uh, uh, for adopting products, so practitioners, uh, and, and as well as talking to the research community uh, and researchers. It's uh, having this, all of the effort that went into this clear descriptions and important uh, uh, considerations, I think, uh, will really help the field. And so I'll just point to two little things, and then, I, then I'm done. We can hand off. Like in my little punch list there, uh, a couple ones that I need to do some more work on. Uh, and I know, I know that districts analyzing our product, uh, when they don't have that first box there, when they don't have a clear logic model that aligns with how we designed the product to be used, they go off on wild goose chases or down rabbit holes. So uh, I am now motivated and I have the right language and even an industry document to say, okay, yeah, we're going to have a more formal, more explicit, more transparent logic model. And the next one down is about the implementation plan and how much it has to be implemented and in what way to expect results. So all, all really good stuff. So it goes on. But I'm going to stop here. And uh, again, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to share. And uh, I know this is going to greatly improve the understandability of our studies going forward. Thanks, Andrew. So there you have a case study on how one of our member companies has used the past guidelines and will be using these current guidelines to improve the work they do around research and especially in providing information to their customer, customers, to educators in the education community. So, and that brings us to our third presenter, Christine Fox who, with CETA, who, who in their quality campaign around educational resources and how they're including the research guidelines as part of that campaign. Christine? Christine? We can't hear you. Let me send her a message. Christine is in Florida, so oh dear. bear with us. <laughs> and I know she was evacuated earlier last week, but was home as of Tuesday. So hopefully infrastructure has failed her there. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for Christine, does anybody have any particular questions? We can please make sure you uh, put them in the chat box and we'll be happy to circle back to those, and I'm just cruising through that now. And you, a question was asked, we'll be able to get a copy of the presentation. Absolutely. So we, put, we post in our archive all of our webinars. Uh, they're recorded. And then, of course, you can see the whole presentation. Uh, also make sure 
that you download a copy of the research guidelines from our website, siianet slash E-T-I-N, and go to resources. Uh, it's the top of our research publication page. And the, the guidelines we have made this time freely available publicly to anyone. So, you know, normally our publications are for members only or they're fee-based for non-members, but we feel very strongly that this particular document can have a huge impact in the education community, so we're sharing that freely with everyone. Bridget, this is Donnell. Um, Christine is calling back in. And um, I also posted the URL for the, uh, the guidelines in the chat box. Great. Hello? Hello. Christine, welcome. Hi. I, I'm not sure what happened. I was not on mute, but I dialed back in. So um, I don't gonna, know what I missed. We're going to blame it on Irma and damage okay. to the infrastructure, okay? <laughs> but Great. we queued up your slides. I gave just a brief, you know, introduction that uh, about the, uh, just that you're the quality campaign at CETA and sure. you've included the guidelines. So you can tell us more. Okay, great. Um, and I, I had started, so I'm going to restart. So uh, welcome to everyone, and thank you to Bridget and SIA for having CETA be a part of this webinar. As Many, and I see some familiar names here in the webinar are familiar with CETA, but just a brief overview for those of you that are not. Uh, we are a 15-year-old nonprofit, and our members are State Department of Education leaders. Um, typically, they are in the digital learning space. However, as many of you may know, we, um, digital learning really does expand across content areas and across departments and includes access to that content, including folks like the CIOs and network leads. So we uh, produce resources uh, in the same way that SIIA does, and we were happy to, um, I was privileged to review these recommendations in advance of their publication and be a part of that release, and we're very happy to be here today because um, evidence-based work is, is a continually important to CETA and its members. Um, CETA as an organization provides professional learning and resources uh, for our members, and all of our resources are open and available to the general public. And just a, a quick overview, because these resources that CETA develops are um, really do focus on the importance of quality and the, the evidence-based guidelines um, kind of tied directly into that. So some of our resources that we have promoted around instructional materials include DMAPS, which is an online portal where you can access state policies around procurement and guidelines for instructional materials. Uh, and also we recently published Navigating the Digital Shift, which does include um, information about the need to focus on high quality resources that are vetted, aligned to standards, and um, include evidence-based practices. And then, um, as Bridget mentioned, the focus uh, today would be our guide to quality instructional materials. This we released last February. I'm excited to share we have a continuation grant to expand that work. And as part of that, we have already added um, the, this recent guideline report. So, at CETA, we've spent a lot of time looking at instruction materials and how they impact uh, student learning outcomes. And we do focus on the need, as I just mentioned, to be aligned to standards, focused on the goals, and accessible to all students. Uh, and we would advocate for planning first uh, and then choosing materials based on, or tools or resources based on your learning goals uh, versus just the idea of having new and innovative tools, but looking at your student educational goals in advance. So CETA, as a part of the process of developing our quality content toolkit, did come up with a definition. Um, originally, we were supposed to have one sentence. As you can see here, we have several, as well as a few bulleted um, comments related to this definition of quality and what is quality. As you can imagine, plus 
uh, state leaders, wordsmithing a definition is rather challenging. We looked at other definitions from the SIMRA group, the Instructional Materials Review Association, as well as others. Um, included in that definition is the importance, um, and I won't read the whole thing to you, but in the first bullet, aligned to state district and building learning standards as measured by widely accepted evaluation tools. So we want to make sure that not only are they aligned to standards, but you're using evaluation tools on these resources and that this um, evidence-based practices that companies have the opportunity to leverage, whether via case studies or pilots, is so critical. And I will say in many cases, uh, at times, our state leaders help to leverage those partnerships so that they can coordinate a company and a state to connect with their districts to provide um, some of this research-based information. And um, within the discussion of quality materials, and that website is fairly comprehensive, and um, I am having some I am having some technical issues not related to Hurricane Irma, but to my personal <laughs> laptop. So if someone would grab that link and put it in, we do have a section on effectiveness. We've included the guidelines in multiple areas of the toolkit because we feel that it's important when you're selecting materials, when you're planning for them, as well as when you're analyzing the effectiveness of materials. So we've tried to scatter it throughout the site. Um, and this was rather, um, we added it now um, as, as a collaborative effort with SIIA. However, we do have more time to kind of include more robust details in the future. Uh, and when we look at the questions that state members came up with regarding meeting those goals, a few things I wanted to highlight were, um, you know, when you think about effectiveness, it has to do with all of the demographics. And so it is a challenge perhaps at times, depending on where you're conducting a study or a pilot, what groups or um, demographic situations you have in those particular places where a district may be willing and they might already have the technical capabilities to test out your um, tool or implement your tool or resource, and they, but they might not have the, all of the various demographics that represent the whole country. So I know that can be a challenge um, when you're looking at best practices and how to evaluate, but those are some things to consider. Um, and then we really, as you can see, almost all of these include something about the learning, and we try to emphasize the fact that the learning is the most important part and not the technology nor the specific uh, digital tool and or instructional material. Um, so I, that was just a brief overview and I know we have some time for question and answer so I'm happy to share but we will we have shared this um, resource with our members and our partners via our news brief um, and we also will continue to do so through our other resources so that everyone is really thinking about how to um, look at tools and resources, evaluate them effectively, and then many times our states may be a part of that process. And if the state is not, then perhaps their districts are, and they also have the ability and capability to disseminate this information to districts or through regional units or intermediate units depending on how their state is organized. So we're always happy to disseminate resources such as this and there are multiple ways that I'm happy to follow up with you or you can share with us. Great. Thanks, Christine. And now on to the the question and answer portion of the webinar, the session. So we have a question up here. Um, and Dennis, you might be the, the best to answer this. So is the type of research ESSA wants different for tech products versus those that aren't tech-based? So digital versus non-digital. Yeah, in terms of what uh, ESSA is looking for, there is no difference. Uh, as the um, and in fact the the ESSA standards themselves are expressed in a couple of sentences, so you don't get a lot of uh, detail. Although in the uh, regulations that accompany the law, there is some more detail that uh, was particularly useful. Um, and I think that um, uh, 
that although the, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of work uh, that can be done, um, and I you could I could point you to a new website that uh, Robert Slavin at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins has put together. He's um, uh, you know developer of uh, of Success for All, which is not a digital platform entirely. Uh, it's mostly not a digital platform. Um, and uh, but it, there's a website called Evidence for HESA that he's put together, and it includes a large number of reading and math products that are uh, conventional uh, products. But what we're seeing is uh, a very large, uh, you know, change in in uh, you know new uh, materials being put together that uh, suggest that you know in another decade. Uh, we will be uh, uh, there will be a tremendous amount more uh, online materials or digital materials. Uh, so we have uh, we oriented the guidelines to uh, uh, ed tech products, obviously because it's uh, coming out of the software industry. Uh, but uh, technically. Uh, the, uh, the, and we do a lot of work uh, at Empirical with uh, professional development programs and, uh, and conventional uh, 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 school programs that um, are not uh, fundamentally digital. Uh, and it's basically the same rule. So the answer is no. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. And Andrew, this question is for you. Do you have any words of wisdom for companies embarking on doing this type of research for the first time? Um, well, I am definitely going to promote the value of, of level two and not to get all uh, – my, my word of wisdom is not to get uh, uh, all over-focused on the, that top-level randomized control trial, but give the other levels uh, – a shot. Uh, like I shared, I was able and am able to do uh, many, many level twos, and I'd like to think that, that uh, that's uh, uh, worthwhile uh, compared to the, the scarcity and the long time duration and the difficulty of implementation for the full RCT. Uh, not to say you don't want to come back to that, but uh, uh, particularly in the the earlier stages of kind of figuring out what works for whom. Uh, I think that, that the level two is great. And then um, level three, like Dennis was showing, sort of the usage versus effect. Uh, uh, I would, uh, just like Dennis said, I would say that that, that is uh, quite meaningful. Um, it's uh, not even uh, controlled necessarily uh, with comparisons, et cetera. However, um, you can get uh, a lot of insight into your, your product or your program and how it's working just from looking at, you know, low use, medium use, high use, and what else is varying along with that. Uh, and it is, it is the case, just like Dennis said, that uh, showing that kind of information to prospective users uh, is also valuable and insightful to them. Great. And although we just recently launched the guidelines at our Education Impact Symposium the end of July, we will be working with our members to um, showcase research they're doing and provide some other tools and resources to help you better implement and use the guidelines. You know, uh, Andrew and Minds Research has uh, been very helpful in, in helping us to figure out what might be some great tools and resources to use as companion pieces to really help you get the work done. So look to our website for additional resources and, and um, opportunities in the future. And I'm seeing another question. This is for Christine. Is there any connection to funding from SEAs or USED related to how high a level of evidence your product shows? Will LEAs receive more funding if they show a higher level of evidence? I do not believe that is the case. Uh, and when you say connection to funding from SEA or ED, um, 
the federal funding and the SEA direct funding usually flow very differently. So um, a state may ha or the department might have higher uh, requirements uh, than one another. So for example, if I'll make this up, but say in Connecticut they're having a um, they have a, a grant program or some type of program there where they're going to be funding. They might have different level of requirements than than U.S. Ed. Um, so I don't think they're necessarily parallel because of the way that states coordinate their funding versus the department. Um, and I don't know anything of LEAs receiving more funding for higher levels of evidence. I think that there's a the minimum requirements in ESSA that they all have to meet. But I would also defer to my colleagues here if they know any different. Yeah, uh, this is Dennis. Uh, and there is a, um, a, you know, these levels of evidence really came out of uh, the Invest in Innovation program, the I3, uh, where uh, uh, the idea was that uh, you you know for a development grant you kind of needed uh, something like uh, a level a level three, uh, but to get a uh, the next level up uh, validation grant, which actually you know you're talking about uh, you know three million dollars versus eight million dollars, um, and to get a scale up uh, grant, which you, now you're talking about twenty million dollars. Uh, and this would go to a nonprofit or to a consortium of, of, of school districts that was undertaking an innovation. Um, uh, that would require a level one, or a random, or maybe even additional, you know, uh, a randomized experiment. So, um, uh, but what I understand is that uh, there are a number of discretionary uh, grant programs in the Department of Education that have adopted these levels with respect to levels of funding. Uh, and um, uh, we're seeing, uh, but that uh, the, uh, you know, beyond the discretionary, uh, the Department of Ed doesn't have any uh, method for, uh, you know, applying these things, especially in so far as they flow down to the states. And I think that, uh, Ultimately, the hope is that the states would take a look at this and realize that, uh, uh, you know, having some evidence um, and at different levels would uh, warrant uh, providing different levels of funding. But the federal law does not have any um, any say over how uh, how the uh, the states are going to uh, implement it. It's more uh, that they uh, suggested or recommended. Thanks, Dennis. And Christine, is the DMAPS resource uh, a place that people can find out more about what the requirements of the state are in terms of learning materials? Will that be helpful? So um, we have policies around procurement and adoption um, and implementation. As of yet, we have not included any, we've included whether or not a state has a vetting process for content at the state level. And as you, most of you probably know, a lot of that is considered a local decision. Uh, so as of yet, we have not included any minimum requirements on evidence-based practices. However, um, we will be marching uh, this winter into uh, enhancing and expanding and updating that data set. So potentially um, that's another area that, that could be included. Great. And there was an a question about where we'll be able to find best practice examples. Um, ETIN will be putting out a call for research exam studies from within its member base, and we're developing, designing, uh, place on the website right now for that to go. So look to us, stay tuned in the future for, you know, for us being kind of that go-to hotspot where we can connect you to what members are doing research and what that might be. Yeah, and as, as that information is, I know you have a membership structure, so if any mm -hmm. of that information is public, CETA would be able to link to that through some of our, our tools as well. 
you can just let us know. Great. Okay. And I'm just so we'll give it a few more minutes, see if we have any other questions materialized there in the chat box. In the meantime, um, thanks. And if you have any suggestions for webinars, would like to speak on a webinar or um, hear more on a particular topic, do let either Donnell or myself know. The next in the Insider Series is defining the MVP, minimal viable product, that is, and it's actually tomorrow at the same time, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 Pacific. Uh, you can sign up for that on our website and join us if that's an interest to you, a dialogue on the intricacies of uh, product management. Okay. Well, we hey, did is, that, I think, in record time. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, this is Andrew. I just wanted to, to put in one last, uh, last plug for folks uh, actually downloading and uh, uh, reading these guidelines. Uh, I just want to say I think it's, uh, it's the most uh, time efficient way for a, a person to bring themselves up to speed in a, in a very kind of tangible real world, what can I do next sort of way in my communications or my studies that's out there. Uh, so don't be intimidated by it being 16 three-page sections or so. Each one of them uh, is a nice little nugget. And, uh, and I hope that uh, a lot of people end up downloading this. And I really would love it if, uh, if on the, uh, the district, the, the practitioner side, if uh, people informed by this kind of thing started asking uh, me as a publisher hey, can you tell me something about your logic model? I think it's just crucially important for us all understanding uh, how, <clears throat> how to get uh, the learning to happen. And uh, so please go to that link and give it a go. And I want to, uh, this is Dennis, and I just want to uh, uh, make, make clear that the guidelines are, uh, we're planning to revise them on a regular basis. Uh, uh, they are, uh, and we have a way to um, uh, take in uh, comments, and we would very much like to uh, get uh, comments on uh, and questions and other things that, if you do read them, uh, we would love to hear uh, your, um, it, you know, what needs to be added, what uh, what uh, questions w remain in your mind. Uh, the other thing too that we are very aware of is how quickly the, uh, the field is changing, uh, the different kinds of technologies, uh, we're at that uh, we need to keep up with. Uh, so the use of, uh, of learning, uh, uh, learning process data, for example, is uh, there's, uh, there are a number of technical issues about uh, how that can be used uh, legitimately in research. Uh, but there's also uh, a lot more uh, uh, that we can learn about the connection between different uh, uh, metrics and uh, different outcomes and so on. So uh, I just want to emphasize that this is a very much a, um, a fast-changing field and that we're uh, very eager to uh, stay uh, caught up with it. Hey, and I um, want to thank uh, everybody for... Um, uh, joining in here. And I would just add that we do have a webinar planned later in the fall on how to effectively use information about the research that you're doing on your products and about your products and your marketing materials. So stay tuned for that one too, how to effectively convey the inf a very complex information uh, by some experts who have done a great job of that. So you can look to that on our website in our schedule of Insider Series webinars. And on that note, I think we are good to go here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please contact Donnell, Puba, or myself. And I'll also be at Edna next week. If anyone is in attendance, happy to answer questions or have a conversation or just get a cup of coffee. So I look forward to seeing some of you there. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.
And thanks to all our speakers. And I'll see you at uh, Ednet Bridge. Thanks, Dennis. Okay. <laughs>